Good morning. All right, well, this morning uh, we are starting a new teaching series uh, called Dave. I just, I just like it. Um, Dave, uh, what we're going to be doing for the next couple months, uh, we're going to be parachuting down into the life of Dave uh, from the Old Testament. Uh, some, I call him Dave. Uh, some people call him David. Others call him King David. Uh, I just like to think that if I lived at the same time that he lived and like we were friends, we would have been on like a more Dave basis. So, uh, so I'm calling it Dave today. But no matter what you call him, uh, David, Dave, Davey, uh, he's a very interesting figure in the Bible. Very interesting. In fact, uh, get this. There's actually more written about him than any other person in the Bible besides Jesus. Like, if you take Jesus out of it for a moment, because obviously Jesus takes number one place, it's his book, um, but under him comes David. In fact, the other runners up, like Elijah, had 10 chapters dedicated to him. It was uh, Abraham and Joseph both had 14 chapters dedicated to them. David, 66 chapters of the Bible, uh, all chronicling his life from his birth right up into his death. It, 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 is, it is really interesting. And, and get this, not only is there 66 different chapters, but his name is mentioned uh, close to 1,100 times in the Bible. Like, just begin to wrap your head around this. Like, he, like clearly, this is a, a figure in the Bible that God wants us to know about, learn about, And so that's what we're going to be doing, but we're not just going to be learning about Dave. Uh, What we're going to do is we're we're going to see the God that Dave points to. Uh, So in this next little journey, I'm really excited myself. A couple other pastors are going to help me preach this, Uh, but we just believe that in and through the life of King David, we're going to see some pretty amazing things about our God. And That's even including this morning. So if you have a Bible, why don't you turn it open with me to 1 Samuel chapter 16. Uh, For the next couple months, we're going to be probably in 1 and 2 Samuel, and then we'll kind of launch out into some other stuff. But uh, let me set this up, because we're kind of going way back. Where we are going to pick up the story, Israel uh, wanted their, their very first king. You see, God came over the people of Israel and said, you're my people, I'm your God, I'm your king, I'm going to lead you. And they said, yeah, that's great, we kind of want somebody else. Uh, and, so, and so there's this back and forth dialogue between them and God, we want a king, he says, this isn't going to go well. They say, we want a king, he says, I'm telling you, it's not going to go well. They say, but we really, really, really want a king. And so he says, okay, isn't it terrifying that sometimes God gives us what we want? Like, I know we always think, like, like it's a good thing. God's going to give me what I want. No, sometimes it's just bad. And he will actually give us what we want. And so here, he tells them, this isn't going to go well. But if you really want a king, I'll give you one. So he calls Samuel. He's the prophet. And he says, "Uh, I want you to go anoint this guy named Saul. Saul. Saul is everything the people are looking for. He's tall. He looks like a warrior. He's got a nice jawline, great beard, you know. All the things that matter in a king. He looks good on a horse. This is what the people want. They want a tall, strong, warrior king. So God says, Samuel, go anoint Saul. They anoint Saul to be the next king. The problem with Saul, however, was even though he looked like a king on the outside, he didn't have the heart of a king on the inside. This is the problem. Like, if you, if you actually track through the story, and there's a whole bunch of pre-story that we're not going to get into, but Saul was a very prideful man. Uh, he often thought that he knew better than the people around him, and sometimes he thought that he knew better than even God. And that's a very dangerous place to live. And so he's constantly fumbling. He's constantly leading Israel into dangerous situations and and all this stuff. He's he's stepping into areas that are not his responsibility. And eventually God says, all right, I'm done with you, Saul. And he says, now we're going to look for the next king of Israel. 
and this time, I'm not going to give the people exactly what they want. I, I, I'm, I'm going to give the people what I want. <laughs> I'm going to give the people a man after my own heart. So what he does is he tells Samuel, here's what I want you to do. I want you to go to Bethlehem. And in Bethlehem, you're going to go to the house of Jesse. And once you find the house of Jesse, he's got a whole bunch of sons. And one of his sons are going to be the next king of Israel. So Samuel goes to Bethlehem, finds the house of Jesse. Jesse gets all of his sons together, brings them out, starting with the oldest. And here's where we're going to pick it up. 1 Samuel 16, starting in verse 6. It says, when they arrived, these are the sons, Samuel saw Eliab, this is the firstborn, the eldest, and thought, surely the Lord's anointed stands here before me. But the Lord said to Samuel, do not consider his appearance or his height, for I have rejected him. The Lord does not look at the things that people look at. People look at outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. Now, this is interesting, right? Like Samuel, of all people, should have, should have known better. This is the Saul situation all over again. Just because you look like a king on the outside doesn't mean you have the heart of the king on the inside. Jesse brings out Eliab and the prophet Samuel, he's excited, right? He, he looks at Eliab, right? He's the all-American athlete. He's the valedictorian. He's on everyone's who's who list. If, if surely, if there's a next king of Israel, this is the guy, right? He just checks off a, a lot of the boxes, and God speaks and says, uh, no, he's not my guy. He, he actually says, Samuel, like, stop it. You, you need to understand my heart. I, I don't pick people the same way that the world picks people. And so Samuel says to Jesse, all right, do you have any other sons? So they bring out the second son, right? He, he ticks off a lot of boxes, maybe not as many as Eliab, but he's still a, a really solid candidate, and God looks at him and says no. Jesse, you got any more sons? They get the third in line. God says no. Fourth, no. Fifth, no. Sixth, no. Seventh, no. They go down through the line seven times. It's, and God just says, no, 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 no. Look at verse 10. It says, Jesse had seven of his sons pass before Samuel. But Samuel said to him, the Lord has not chosen these. So he asked Jesse, are these all the sons you have? Well, they're still the youngest, Jesse answered, and he's tending to the sheep. Now, I love <laughs> I love this question that Samuel asked. He's like, Jesse, look at me. Are you sure you don't have any other sons? <laughs> I know this is complicated, okay? Are you sure that you're not forgetting any, right? And it's this moment where, like, Jesse's like, oh, yeah, I do. <laughs> there, I had eight, I forgot, <laughs> yeah. And so what he does is he says, yeah, I have, I have another son. And honestly, like Parkwood, when I read this, I get it. I honestly do. My dad had eight kids. Eight kids. Just like Jesse in this story. I, just like David, am the eighth kid. Like, I'm, I'm, I'm the runt of the litter. Like, growing up, if my dad ever wanted to call me by name, it was hilarious like, honestly, he'd, he'd be like, hey, uh, Rick, Doug, Roxanne, Marty, uh, Chris, Dale, uh, Dan, Dan, that's it. Like, you know, and like, this was like my whole life growing up. Like, I know what it's like to be last on the list, okay? But what's horrible about this story is that Dave, he's not even on the list, okay? He didn't even make it. Like, his... His dad just completely forgets about him. So Samuel's like, hey, uh, Jesse, I, I, I think you're forgetting one of your own children. And so he goes out and he gets him. Look at verse 12. So he sent for him and had him brought in. He was glowing with health and had a fine appearance and handsome features, as all eighth kids in line do. If you want to know what David looked like, you're pretty much looking at him right now, you know. <clears throat> uh, <love> you, 
<laughs> the most literal translation of verse 12 says this, that David had beautiful eyes and was handsome. Now, I know that seems like a compliment, but keep in mind, they're, they're not evaluating him for a spot on The Bachelor. They're evaluating him to be the next warrior king of Israel. The, the, the point is that he doesn't look like a warrior king. When, when you're searching for the next warrior king over a nation, you want a dude who looks like they can kill all the other dudes. You understand what I'm talking about? Like, you want a king with eyes so terrifying that all the other nations are going to flee, not a king with eyes so beautiful that they're going to get lost in them, right? <laughs> the, the point is, David here doesn't, he, he doesn't hit the checklist. He's, he's not the obvious candidate. David, surely it's not him. He's too young. He's too pretty. And then you look at verse 12. I, I love this. Then the Lord said, Rise and anoint him. This is the one. So Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the presence of his brothers. And from that day on, I love this, the spirit of the Lord came powerfully upon David. Oh, this is so good. God bypasses the first, second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh born sons to get all the way down to the eighth in line. And then he says, this is my guy. This is the next king of Israel. And then David is anointed, and anointing's back then. Oh, have you ever been anointed by oil in our church? Oh, like, you know, we get a little bit of oil, we dab it on your head, and it's a nice moment. Back then, it's like you got a horn of oil. It's like, it's like a bath, you know. It's, and it says that in this moment, that when David was anointed with oil, it says that the Holy Spirit came powerfully upon him. And interesting is that over David's life, it actually never says that the Holy Spirit left him. And he had like some serious ups and downs in that journey, which is like oddly comforting to me. Um, that, that there's just this moment, the Holy Spirit came down. And, and honestly, today, this is as far as we're going to go in the story. Um, but a, as I was studying this, there, there was a question that just seemed so obvious, and I kept coming back to it, which was, what's with all the drama? Like, what's with all, like, the rigmarole? Like, if God knew that David was to be the next king, why didn't he just say to Jesse, hey, I'm moving on from Saul, and uh, what we're going to do is uh, I've already picked out somebody. He's in Bethlehem in the house of Jesse. His name's Dave. He's going to be out in the field when you get there. Go to him. But that's not what happens. God intentionally sets up this entire scene where you have all of these brothers coming and, and God saying, no, 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 yes. Right? Like, like why? What's with all the drama? Well, I, I think all of this is, is intentionally to teach us a few different things. And so what I want to do today, I have three points because they tell me every good sermon has three points and uh, if you're taking notes, why don't you uh, write this down? There's three things that I want us to learn about God that I think are very important that we can kind of pull out of what we just read. The first thing is this. God looks on the inside. God looks on the inside. Samuel sees Eliab, the firstborn, and says, surely this is him. And like, remember what God says? He's like, stop it. Stop it. What? Man looks this way. God, I, I don't look at outward appearance. I look at the heart. He's looking on the inside. I, I was actually thinking about this outward appearance thing. And it's just so true. Like our world right now, we judge books by their cover all the time. Come on, let's, let's just be honest, right? Like we meet people and within moments of meeting them, talking to them, we make snap judgments, we just do. We look at their clothes. We look at their hair. We listen to the way they speak. All this kind of stuff. And within moments, we've already made up our mind. We, 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 we judge. And, and, and this, is, this is just how our world works. It's, it's messed up, but it is how our world works. What's, what's really messed up is when this starts to play itself out in the church. When in here, 
Like in the body of Christ, in the family of God, when, when we come in with one another and we start judging each other by the externals, by what we look like, right? And so we just kind of walk around and, did you see her shoes? <laughs> He's wearing a hat again, come on, man. Pastor's at least wearing a collar today, I can take him seriously. <laughs> he didn't put on another sweater, right? Like, <laughs> this is what we do. Don't hide it, you judge me. I know you do. <laughs> it's toxic. It's incredibly toxic. Now, now, don't get me wrong. The Bible actually does talk about our clothes. It does. And it's pretty simple. It says that we should dress modestly. It does. It says that we shouldn't be dressing in any way to uh, entice another person or cause another person to stumble. That is very biblical. And that is for males and females. That is... That, that, that is a great guideline. But that's pretty much it. Um, you know, last time I checked, there, 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 there just wasn't anything in there about suits or hats or jeans versus slacks or anything. And, and, and I, I was thinking about this. And you, you want to know why there's not a lot of guidelines? This is going to set some people free. Are you ready? Because God doesn't care. We do. We, we're Samuel in this story. Okay? We're Samuel. We're the one. We judge by outward appearance all the time. God says, man, I, I'm not nearly as concerned with what you're wearing on the outside as much as I am the state of your heart on the inside. This is God saying, that I, I, I don't pick people. I don't look the same way. I don't look where people look. I look at the heart. So the question this morning is just this. How's your heart? Like, when God looks on the inside, and he does, what does he see? How's your heart? I, I love what Jesus said. Matthew chapter 5, verse 8. This is in the Sermon on the Mount. Uh, he said, Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Oh, that's so good. But you need to understand, God's not looking for the perfect person. He's not. David was not a perfect person, and we are going to see that on full display in the weeks to come. What he's looking for is a people who have a heart after him. That's what he's looking for. Blessed are the pure in heart. God says to Samuel, stop it. Stop judging by the externals, the exteriors, the appearances. He says, this is not how I work. So the first thing, Parkwood, that we need to see this morning, and it hits all of us, is that we need to understand, although we can dress and present and act a certain way, you might be able to impress other people. That does not impress God. Okay? He's, he, that's not what he looks at. The first thing that we got to get on board with is this, that God looks on the inside. That's the first point. The second thing that we can learn out of this story is this, that God chooses the unlikely. God chooses the unlikely. In fact, this might be one of the most consistent, reoccurring themes in the Bible. God routinely is choosing the people that no one thinks he would choose. Like in Genesis, he chooses the humble offering of Abel over the rich offering of Cain. He gives the blessing to the younger Jacob, not the firstborn Esau. When he was choosing someone to lead the Exodus, he, he chooses the stammering Moses and not the well-spoken Aaron. And here in this story, he chooses Dave out in the field, a 15-year-old pretty boy, so unlikely that his father, his own father, didn't even think of him. God says, no, he's, he's the one that I want. God chooses the unlikely. You see, secular human history, it just seems to go this way, that it favors the most beautiful of women and the strongest of men. But God consistently chooses the Jacobs and the Leahs and the pretty little Davids out in the field to build his kingdom. He chooses the overlooked, the underdog, those who are despised by the world so that all the glory will belong to him. So that all the glory, and like, listen, if this were not true, 
you just need to know, like, I wouldn't be standing before you today. Like, and, and this is not false humility. This is, let, let, let me tell you, I'm not in the position that I'm in right now because I was the brightest, smartest, best. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not pastoring this church because I come from a long line of pastors in the Gray family. I, I don't. I'm here because God chooses the unlikely. Honestly, that, that, that is the only way that I can make any sense of this. And you, you have to see, like 1 Corinthians uh, 1, 27 to 28, this is what Paul teaches the church in Corinth. He says, but God chose the foolish things of this world to shame the wise. He chose the weak things of this world to shame the strong. God chose the lowly things of this world and the despised things, all the things that are not, to nullify the things that are. Watch this. So that no one may boast before him. So listen, if God is moving in and through your life right now, great. Praise God. But please do not make the mistake of thinking it's because of you. It's because of him. It's because of him and only him. And so listen, if you're here today and you don't feel like you're the smartest, the brightest, the best, you feel like you're the eighth child in line, here's the good news. God does a lot of great things through the eighth children. Okay? I understand I also just threw myself into that analogy. <laughs> God chooses the unlikely. So here's, here's the call. Just stay humble. Stay humble. When God finds a heart sold out to him, he will bypass the obvious to pick the unlikely. This is great. So God looks on the inside, okay? He chooses the unlikely, and then the, the, the last thing that I wanna talk about, worship team, you guys come on back up, is this, that God comes to change the heart. And how does he do this? How, how does God come and change our hearts? Well, he does this through the power of the Holy Spirit who comes to take up residence and live inside of us. Like, go back to that picture, right, of David. He's anointed with oil, and in that moment, it says that the Holy Spirit came powerfully upon him. And in the same way that the Holy Spirit came powerfully upon uh, little, pretty, beautiful-eyed David, the Holy Spirit wants to come inside our lives and move powerfully. Like, it's important that you understand, like, we are living in the age of the Holy Spirit right now. Like Jesus ascended up into heaven where he is right now at the right hand of the Father. And, and as Jesus went up, the Holy Spirit came down, right? And, and what he does, like the Holy Spirit, it's, it's the Holy Spirit that mediates the presence of Christ in the church. It's the Holy Spirit who, who, who moves in our lives in all sorts of different ways. It's the Holy Spirit who empowers us to witness about Christ. It's the Holy Spirit who, who supernaturally gifts us for the edification and the building up of the church, but today, I even want to make it more simple than that. What the Holy Spirit wants to do is he wants to come in and he wants to change our hearts. He wants to actually change our desires. You see, the more that we walk with God, he doesn't just change the way that we think, he can actually change the way that we feel. And this is a beautiful thing. I mean, this is what Ezekiel prophesied, he, that, that when God comes in, that he would remove our heart of stone. It's like a heart transplant, and he comes and he gives us a heart of flesh. David wrote about this. Years after the Holy Spirit came powerfully on him, David wrote Psalm 37. And I've heard this verse a lot in my life, but I just want to drop it on you. 37 verse four, David wrote, take delight in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. You know, for a long time, I read this verse, and I thought, well, that's pretty awesome. If I follow Jesus and surrender to Jesus and worship Jesus, and, and he's going to give me whatever I want. He's going to give me the desires of my heart, and he's like a genie in a bottle, right? He's like a vending machine. All you have to do is put in the right coins, push the right buttons, and boom, you're going to get always what you want. And that's actually not what this is saying at all. This is not saying, take delight in the Lord, and he will give you whatever you want. It's, 
saying take delight in the Lord, and the more that you do that, he will actually give you the desire of your heart. He will transplant desires into you. Your, your heart will change. Your desires will change. Your feelings will change. The more that you press into him, the more that you surrender to him, the more that you delight in him, it doesn't just hit up here how we think, it's how we feel. We take delight in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. He'll put them in you. God comes to change our hearts. Can we stand on up to our feet? I think just one of the problems, um, just being humans, is that sometimes our desires are just misguided. Um, if you're anything like me, you just, and you kind of know those moments, it's, it's just we're not in line. We're not desiring the things of God. We get our minds and our attention and our focus onto earthly things. Our desire becomes for that American dream, that North American dream, where you need a house and your kids and you need the retirement fund and you need the cars and the programs, the sports. You get all this stuff in our head and it's not that any of that stuff is wrong in and of, its, in and of itself, but, but when was the last time that we actually stopped and asked, God, is this what you want for my life? instead of just buying into this narrative that the world pitches us all the time, that if you do this, then you'll be happy. And our desires sometimes are just misled. We, we, we miss the mark. And, and I think the, the beauty of what happens here is, again, God's not looking for the, the, the perfect person. If that were true, none of us could be in this room right now but he's looking for the person who will continually come back to take delight in the Lord in the highs and in the lows. When this world throws you for a curveball and you find yourself in situations that you never thought that you would be in, it's in those moments and when you turn to God and you say, you are still king, you are Lord, you are the one that I'm looking after, hungry for. It's in those moments that what God does is, man, he does surgery on our hearts and he begins to change us from the inside out. And so church, I just wanna call us as we start this series and as we're just looking into the life of David, we see, yeah, he's looking on the inside. He's choosing the unlikely people, but what he wants to do is heart surgery. He wants to come on in and, and do that work. And, but the one onus on us is this, take delight in the Lord. He's not gonna force himself on you. He's not just gonna do it. It's in the process of us turning to him and saying, God, I owe you everything now. It's in that process that he begins to do the work in us. So we're, we're gonna sing one more song this morning. And um, yeah, I just wanna encourage you, just whatever it is, whatever it is today, lay it down at the feet of Jesus. Lay it down at his feet. Let's look to the Lord. Let's take delight in the Lord and let's let him do the work that he does next. Amen?